Congo. Too backward to realize the inheritance it offered, the untapped resources of their vast continent. Wealth lay wasting. In the 19th century came the first great chain, who listened to the white man, weighed their proposals to work and harvest the land, for enterprise like this needed cooperation. Yes, the soil of the Congo was rich with promise, but only by such labor did men turn it into wealth. Cotton, copper, zinc, palm oil, new towns, factories, railways, airlines, what was sown with struggle and patience now yields a precious harvest. A hundred thousand acres of country. The army would seize the women of the village and hold them hostage in order to force the men of each village to go into the forest and gather a monthly quota of wild rubber. Estimates put the total number of murdered Congolese at well over 10 million. Colonialism is not a thinking machine. It is violence in its natural state. And it will only yield when confronted with greater violence. Nous qui avons souffert qui est de l'oppression colonialiste, nous vous le disons, tout peut, tout cela est désormais fini. La République du Congo a été proclamée et notre cher pays est maintenant entre les mains de ses propres enfants. Ensemble, nous allons commencer une nouvelle lutte. Nous allons établir ensemble la juste rémunération de son travail. Nous allons veiller à ce que l'été de notre patrie profite véritablement à ses enfants. Keep Katanga free. President Chombe has declared that secession is promised. Did you join President Chambi's army? I come from South Africa. I think it's about high time that communism was stopped in the Congo. Through all these events, your directors and I have asked ourselves only one question. To what extent will the operations of your company be affected? We are pleased to record that the events of this particular week taking place as they did in Stanleyville province, over a thousand miles from the main seat of our mining operations, need not in any way directly concern us. Bajo la bandera de las Naciones Unidas, en el Congo, fue asesinado Lumumba. El otro día, los paracaidistas belgas, Lumumba, volaron la estatua del expresidente del Congo. Y la estatua que recuerda a Lumumba, hoy destruida, pero mañana reconstruida, nos recuerda también en la historia trágica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo pero ni tantito nada What you have to fight for is independence of the one country and being able to use the resources of our country to improve the living conditions of our people the honest trader, the despoiler, the man of vision, those who came only to take, and those who had something to give in exchange. Hello, 
and welcome to the Unequal Exchange podcast. This is our first episode in our ongoing series using an unequal exchange framework to look at the history of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We'll be analyzing the history of the Congo through the colonial extraction of resources to the unequal exchange in trade and the disparity of wages between the Congo and the global north and how all of this contributes to the ongoing destruction of the Congo and its people by the West. In this first episode, we'll be using a historical analysis to look at the life of Argyria Emanuel, the principal theorist of unequal exchange, who also worked and spent time in the Congo as an advisor to Patrice Lumumba and Antoine Gazenga, two leaders of the independent struggle for the Congo. By doing so, we'll look at how Emmanuel's unequal exchange theory was fundamentally inspired by the history and struggle of the Congolese people and used it as a basis of a framework for the liberation of the third world. To begin, Peter, would you like to address why we're doing this series? So with the Congo, we definitely wanted to look at this as a pretty great example of the economic imperialism that Emmanuel focuses on in his work. And it's a really good case study in this whole importance of devalued third world labor in producing these cheap resources for the benefit of the rich first world countries. And the way it plays out in terms of different political coups and military invasions and proxy forces and so on with Rwanda and that's later on. But then also with Emmanuel, it's really fascinating looking at Emmanuel's role in the Congo, and lots of this is new research, basically. Some people have a view of, broadly speaking, third worldist economic and political thought as being detached from the real world. But if you have a look at what Emmanuel did in his life, and he's really like the the most important third worldist economist, I think it's fair to say, you know, he was an incredibly active political activist. And uh, that's another great reason to have a look at this whole story. Absolutely. As you mentioned, there's not a lot of biographical information publicly accessible about Arguri Emanuel. There's no publicly available biography written about him. The best for that information you can get is John Brolin's dissertation called The Bias of the World, where he talks a lot about Arguri Emanuel's history. That's where a lot of this information comes from. And other details come from personal correspondence or information that hopefully we can begin to let more people know about who are interested. So to begin, we can talk about Arguri's biography and just talk a little quickly about what we're going to focus on. So although he was born in 1911 in Greece and studied economics and commerce at the University of Athens, he would make this move to the Belgian Congo in 1937 to work in commerce. Particularly, he's working, as Berlin notes, in his family textile trade. So he likely worked as an accountant and helped keep track of the textile trading. He was also a communist early on. So he had very clear political involvement stemming from his university days. And he had carried this on into the 1940s when World War II broke out. And he was fighting on the side of the Greek communist partisans in the Greek Civil War. He was jailed in 1944 when they led an uprising against the Greek government in exile in Cairo, which is probably a whole story for another day about the Greek civil war. It's very fascinating. After he was jailed in 1944, he was sent to a prison camp in Sudan by the British administration, which was on the side of the Greek government in exile in Egypt. And during that time in that camp, he was able to write a textbook on dialectics, and he was actually teaching other prisoners dialectic. So again, another story perhaps, but very interesting. And then he escaped from that prison in Sudan. Luckily, after he escaped, he was pardoned and he made an apology or confession, not of guilt necessarily, but just of his involvement in this uprising against the government. Then after he was pardoned, he returned to the Belgian Congo, where he would join up with Patrice Lumumba's Congolese national movement as an economic advisor. He would write a lot of articles for the Stemme de la Loire, which was a newspaper. And he made a lot of observations, particularly around the fact that 
settlers who were arriving in the Congo, a lot of Greeks in particular, would play a very interesting intermediary role with respect to economics as merchants and small traders. So Emmanuel made some observations on this. We'll get into more of what happens as he is advising Patrice Lumumba. That's the basis of what we want to talk about today. And then what happens in the 1960s as the Congo crisis erupts, Emmanuel is personally taken hostage and he is doing a lot of his work advising the resistance that emerges as Patrice Lumumba is deposed and executed in the Congo crisis when multiple factions emerge. So that's the basis of our episode today and how it informs 60, 61 when he's advising and 62 when he leaves and goes to France and publishes Unequal Exchange, his major text for the first time in French. And then later on, another source for this episode is his article, White Settler Colonialism and the Myth of Investment Imperialism, which has a lot of reflections on his time in the Congo. So to begin, maybe we can talk about how his time in the Congo helped to develop unequal exchange theory. And this is based on a few of his 1950 articles that he wrote for Le Stanley de Loire, which has a lot of ideas that relate to unequal exchange. In these 1950s articles for Le Stanley de Loire, Emmanuel writes a lot of very interesting critiques around what he's observing in the Congo. So one, for example, is these buyers unions that are being set up by settlers and merchants. Essentially what they're doing, they're like consumption organizations. So they're arguing against the commercial gains tax that's being placed on consumption goods in the Congo. They want the administration to lower these commercial gains taxes and they want to make consumption more affordable in the Congo. And Emmanuel makes a lot of these arguments with respect to consumption and the organization of settlers and merchants. A lot of his arguments are related to the fact that he's very critical of this view that monopolies are the main problem when it comes to imperialism. In his opinion, it's not just monopolies, but it's also settlers and merchants, like the small intermediaries who do the work of capitalism when going and traveling. They promote trade and they promote this unequal exchange, which we'll discuss. So that's one instance of the things he's noticing. He's observing certain commodities. So for example, Berlin has this really interesting note in one of his articles where Emmanuel is studying a few example commodities like a textile blanket, some different grapes, and then fish. And he's observing how, for example, this blanket, it's costing 75 francs in the Congo where it's being exported to by Belgian traders or Greek traders. And then it's costing 89 francs in Belgium where it's actually produced. And he literally says two steps from where it's produced, it's 89 francs. And Berlin concludes that this is one of Emmanuel's first observations on international prices and remuneration and distribution being higher in Belgium than in the Congo. Another thing with respect to unequal exchange theory is his observations around the mobility of capital and the equalization of the profit rate. So he notices that Greeks in the Congo helped to promote this equalization of the rate of profit in the long run by actually doing the business of going out and trading. And in addition, he's very critical of, again, the views from this one school of thought of the left, which says that monopolies are just a problem because he looks at how the Union Minière of Belgium, the main mining company, promotes a lot of movement of capital and doesn't necessarily block the movement of capital or act in a monopolistic way, but promotes the equalization of the rate of profit. And why are these points important for Emmanuel? First, with respect to consumption, then especially the rate of profit and its equalization, and looking at commodities and seeing why is it that his theory revolves around saying the commodity could actually be more expensive in Belgium than it is in the Congo. Yeah, it's really fascinating hearing you talk about these early ideas of Emmanuel back in the 1950s. And he's saying things which are still very contemporary, especially talking about the price differences between low-wage and high-wage countries, which is something that lots of contemporary analysts of economic imperialism focus on as well. Think about John Smith's book about imperialism. He begins by comparing the different price of something which is produced for cheap in Bangladesh and then sold very, very high price in London in the global north. 
with the first point about the critique of the buyers unions, I think it's a really key aspect of Emmanuel's thought that poor low wage countries have a disadvantage in the capitalist system. He also argues that under capitalism, the poor countries are necessarily disadvantaged precisely by increased liberalization, precisely by increased market trade with the rest of the world, which then goes against the idea that the problem isn't trade, but the problem is some kind of you know bad government decisions. And Emmanuel's work does a really great job of critiquing this idea. Lots of contemporary studies of these price differences, global imperialism between poor and rich countries, they focus on how the, the high wages of the richer country are what allows it to capture more value from, say, the global value chains, despite not doing actually more work just because of these political conditions where their workers are allowed to have higher wages, that their lives are valued more in the current sort of world system. Because of that, those countries are able to appropriate more value. In these early articles, does he also focus on the wage differences being the root cause of these price differences? It's really interesting to bring that up because he's especially noting that wages of the Congolese workers are so low compared to those of the settler Belgian workers. What you were saying about noticing that the remuneration of the two commodities is different. I think one of his first inclinations on the equalization of the rate of profit. So he's not saying, I'm going to go down this path and see, okay, maybe it's something has to do with different rates of profit or different rates of productivity. Once he rules that out by saying there's an equalization of that rate in the same article, I think it's there that you have the theoretical opening of saying, if it's not this factor of price of production, it has to be the other, the only other factor, variable capital. And pairing that with these observations he makes at the time in some other articles talking about just how bad wages are and how low they are for Congolese workers in particular, I think he would have definitely been picking up on that. You were talking about how important it is that he focuses on this tendency towards equalization of the rate of profit. And this was really a really important breakthrough that Emmanuel did because so much work, especially on the left by different Marxists, on colonialism and the reasons for divergence in economic development between formerly colonized countries and first world European colonizer countries. They always focused on this idea of there being these insidious monopolies that extract absurdly high rates of profit in the third world and that in by so doing they miserate the colonized countries by taking everything through these high rates of profit but then emmanuel's work just as someone who actually lived in a colonized country and also worked as a small businessman he saw with his own eyes this wasn't really true that you had actually quite similar profit rates that there was plenty of movement of capital that the monopolies weren't shutting off the market to all capital and then and Hilferding and so on, all those early 20th century, late 19th century theorists of imperialism, they always focus on monopolies and high rates of profit. It's a really an incredibly important breakthrough that Emmanuel made in yeah. his, already in these early works based on his experience. When we talked about white settler colonialism earlier, that other article, a lot of the basis of that article, and honestly, a lot of the basis of an equal exchange is kind of a critique of the left and critique of aspects of Leninist analysis of imperialism. And then Emmanuel's work is really designed not to say monopolies are, are not bad or justify monopolies, but instead to say that that analysis is only part of the problem. In particular, something that comes out with a lot of his work relating to the Congo is that he's saying a lot of the left, whether it's the Belgian left or the, the settler left in the Congo itself, a lot of their energy goes towards criticizing monopolies. And so they give a pass to the smaller merchants and capitalists who actually do the work of equalizing the rate of profit, actually do the work of spreading capitalism and trade. In particular, the political conclusions of that are really devastating, which we'll see in a little bit. I just want to go through very quickly some of his other points that he's not necessarily writing or observing in the 1950s, but that he picks up later on in his 1972 article, where he takes a lot of these observations that he had and integrates them into an unequal exchange framework. So one of those in particular will help give context to what is happening in the Congo as he's there and as independence occurs. So he writes about how, for example, on the eve of independence, the Congo has 
a national income of more than, more than 50 billion francs, and that this revenue is divided approximately in half between 110,000 whites and 14 million Congolese on the other hand. So just this devastating disparity of wealth in the Congo. And one of the reasons that he's very precisely observing that is that the base salary for the white employee could be anywhere between 15,000 francs a month to 45,000 francs a month. So having this range around, especially what their salary is based on what their consumption is, the white settlers would be able to obtain villas. And then in comparison, the average income for Congolese workers is around 2,000 francs a year. So there's a very intense income disparity. And that wage difference is absolutely what he will talk about with respect to unequal exchange. He also notes that the proletariat of the Congo was very numerous. There were around 1 million and 100,000 employees. So compared to other countries on the eve of independence, the Congo had quite a high classical account of what would be a proletariat. But in spite of that, and again, I think speaking to the state of an underdeveloped capitalism in a colonized country, the settlers in the Congo would still use forced recruitment and forced labor. So it's not as clear to say that there is a an organized wage proletariat and it's moved past all forms of feudalism because there's slavery still occurring in the Congo at this time. Another really interesting observation he makes is he points to the status of clerics, what is known as the elites or évolué in, in French. He actually characterizes them as kind of their own sort of labor aristocracy within the Congo, especially with respect to the status of other like Congolese workers or proletariat when independence comes, because you have this whole class that is considered more upwardly mobile, often serving on the bureaucracy. And he notes that they're literally like a class unto their own. This is the kind of potential basis for a national bourgeoisie, but he's very clear in saying this is more of a comprador class, more of a lumpen bourgeoisie, as Andre Gunder Frank would put it. He makes some very interesting observations in his writing about how during the move to independence, a lot of strikes that were occurring would be demanding for the end of the high salaries of clerks, demanding that this evaluate class have its own kind of reduction in their wages. And seeing pretty clearly, I think that the movement that's developing in the Congo at this time is both enraged at Belgian colonialism, Belgian settlers, but also a kind of comprador class that's emerging, which I think is a really interesting insight. And he makes some observations about how this class in particular, post-independence, is looking for the same standard of living as the white civil servants that they are in after independence seeking to replace. I think it's very interesting to see this kind of early critique of what's going to be the state of affairs post-independence and a very clear siding with the lower classes, the lower stratum in the Congo, particularly the proletariat that has a very low wage, but even beyond that, the forced labor of the peasant class. It reminds me of another book that we we're reading for this podcast, which is by Georges Zongol Talaja, called The Congo from Leopold to Kabila, People's History. And it also takes aim quite often at this Evoluaire class, which was the, the ruling class in basically all the post-colonial independent African nations, and often with this kind of tendency to really favor the colonizer culture. One of the really fascinating things about the colonial attempts to create a loyal administrative class is that this often kind of backfired, and this led to the ethnic conflicts in the newly independent countries. In the Congo, the Belgians, they supported the Lulua as this minority that was favored by the colonial administration, and then they also educated them more than they did the majority Luba group. But then it ended up being that the Lua, which had been favored, they actually ended up going against the Belgians. This was already in the 1950s, 1940s, one of the most active pro-independence forces because they'd been educated and then now they wanted to have more privileges as this kind of administrative class and had to be in charge of the government themselves rather than answering to the Belgian colonists. And then in response, the Belgians started supporting the Luba, the majority. This resulted in ethnic violence that was often fanned by the Belgian administration in the hopes of weakening the independent Congo. This conflict was also a really important episode in the assassination of uh, Lumumba because the ethnic conflict was taking place in the Kasai area, 
there was this session attempt, which then the Western powers really critiqued Lumumba for supposedly, you know, engineering a genocide there in the attempt to quell the secession. And then this was used as justification by the UN and uh, the Western powers to start really limiting Lumumba's powers. In Rwanda, also, the colonial administration, they always supported the minority Tutsi group. And they gave them various privileges, which they already kind of had before colonization, but then the Belgians really exacerbated these privileges. It resulted that there were some puts independence activists towards the end of the Belgian colonial period, but then Belgium in response started supporting reactionary Hutu groups, which led large upswell in different ethnic violence in the late 1950s, which was called the, the Hutu Revolution. I think it relates really well to the next part I wanted to talk about, which is some of Emmanuel's observations around putting the Congo into its proper context historically. One aspect that we forget, at least in a lot of analysis we forget about, is that the Congo was a settler colonial country, especially in the Katanga region. And this directly influenced the relations that were coming into play amongst the various nations or ethnic groups within the Congo that had been colonized, how they perceived one another around this settler class that had developed. As Emmanuel mentioned, around 110,000 people. Le dimanche matin, on passe le temps dans les centres familiaux, sportifs ou socioculturels flamands ou wallons. On fait du tennis ou du bateau sur le fleuve, ou on va déjeuner à la campagne. Le climat est détendu, on évoque les relations entre Belges et Zaïrois. Comme ici ces joueurs de cartes, agents d'une société privée, ce qui laisse parfois percer une certaine incompréhension, voire une certaine incommunicabilité. On a eu une belle époque, mais maintenant... On a eu une belle époque, on a eu une belle fidèle, époque mais... dans les années 60. Dans le euh... là, c'est encore... Ouais. Euh... Actuellement, oui. notre pouvoir d'achat a chuté d'une façon terrible. Mais ça, c'est l'habitude des Belges. Hein. Quand ils sont ici, ils se mettent, ils se mettent à critiquer. Mais dites-leur un peu de rentrer en Belgique. But it's very interesting, a lot of his writing, where he talks about this kind of balance of forces. How is the metropole playing different groups off of one another to maintain what its interests are? And the settlers are not necessarily, and I think as Emmanuel argues quite clearly, not actually just an extension of the metropole's interests, but have their own set of interests as actors. Emmanuel, in particular, he's talking about how the settlers are the most resistant to Africanization and independence. They believe that in the Katanga region, they would rather set up an apartheid state similar to South Africa or Australia or Rhodesia. They would rather have this independent white state in the Congo than succumb to independence. And Emmanuel makes a lot of really interesting observations as to how this is going to relate when the Katanga secession crisis comes up, who is actually backing Moïse Shambé which I think is re directly related to what you're saying around how different actors pick and choose kind of forces that they're going to support when the balance of forces comes into play. One of Manuel's main points of saying all that is to figure out why it is, especially when it relates to Shambay and the Katanga secession, that a lot of the left globally will sort of misidentify uh, the balance of forces and what's at stake with a false analysis of the situation that often gives a pass to the settlers or the actors on the ground who are actually making the life of the Congolese people worse. And in particular, in his 1972 New Left Review article, he says, all of this analysis based on anti-monopoly pro-settler analysis that comes out of the different colonial newspapers like L'Avenir Colonial or Le, Le Stanley de Loire, he refers to these settlers as the ultra who want an apartheid state. That was also a term from the Algerian war. Yeah. They also called those French settlers that tried to create a white ethno state in Algeria. Yeah. And Emmanuel also talks about them in Unequal Exchange, about how the yeah. composition of these extremist white supremacist forces in Algeria is that they weren't the richest white Algerians. The richest white Algerians, they were essentially fine with the independence of Algeria. They could adapt to it, essentially. But for this white working class, they had this phrase, this either the bullet or the suitcase. They had no choice but to fight to the death, basically, for their position. Otherwise, they had to leave. 
yeah. privileged position in the settler colony. Thank you so much yeah. for putting that up, actually, because that's very related to when he's making these different comparisons of Algeria and then the Katanga secession. And it's great to have that example for an equal exchange, too, because I think that illustrates what his point in that section that he's talking about is. It relates to an acquired wage being something that will motivate these different actors politically. And so with this analysis that Emmanuel has, which I think is very similar to a kind of critique of settlers and the white working class adoption of settlers and all of its privileges that other writers like Jay Sakai in particular have kind of picked up on, Emmanuel shows really, even before that text or before a lot of the contemporary criticism, he's very perceptive around what the interests of settlers actually are. I think he's very critical of the left seeing them as petit blanc. So just these little, and emphasizing the little, like they're a small actor, they're a small working class who is being oppressed by the monopolies and could be, you know, a revolutionary force. But he's very clear that any time that they have a kind of a political expression, like one of these figures, Charles Bonte, who is a Belgian extremist, an ultra settler who goes around the Congo preaching the adoption of apartheid in the 1950s. And he notes the Katanga secession is not the first instance of secession in the Congo. The Belgian government had discovered three separate plots in 1960 aimed at proclaiming the independence of Katanga. And this is before it's actually going to occur. You know, he talks about the fact that a lot of these militants had contacts in Rhodesia. So this kind of network of a white supremacist settler states around Africa at this time. And that the first attempt had been made as early as 1946. So there's a long history. I think this really helps to critique a lot of writing around the Congo that presents, honestly, a lot of the history that could just happen all of a sudden for really no reason. Like when they talk about the Katanga secession, you rarely get the context that there is a lot of interest behind the secession happening. They presented in the 1960s, like Shambe woke up one day and wanted to secede from the Congo, but there is a lot of history behind these interests, particularly of these settler interests. All of this helps really clarify Emmanuel's position. And he has this great line where he says that a lot of these false positions or false analysis makes for grave misunderstandings and prevents any true dialogue between revolutionary Marxism and the decolonized people. So there's a constant emphasis on saying, how do we actually make an analysis that makes anti-imperialist struggle possible, that looks at what are the actual balance of interest within the underdeveloped countries that the left has often made this kind of anti-monopoly support of the little guy. And he makes many examples of how Lenin had, you know, picked the side of the Boers in the Anglo-Boer War against the English and all these analyses that don't really get at the heart of taking a very principled position in support of the anti-colonial struggle. I really like his work on this, his critique of these different historical positions on various wars. In the third world, he also mentions Mao's support for, in Nigeria, the Bayer secession. I think his work is a really great illustration of analyzing the internal dynamics going on in the country itself, because often there can be a dangerous tendency on the left to romanticize different events happening in foreign countries and support some side because they are fighting against a bigger enemy. And it's kind of similar to what you're saying about this romanticization of the petty blancs because they're weaker than the big business. So that means yeah. that they must be a progressive force. But, you know, what you can see is that often the sort of forces that might seem maybe you know weaker, they have a much more reactionary program for society, which means that it's not really so simple as just, you know, always rooting for the underdog kind of American kind of style, Hollywood styles looking at things that you really need to have a look at the economic interests of these different social groups in the context. I think that relates really well to the next section we want to talk about, the analysis of the Katanga secession. Before we do that, maybe just a little bit more context as we're moving historically into the 1960s. I think many people are familiar with Patrice Lumumba, but knowing exactly how Emmanuel came to know him and came to be an advisor for him. So Lumumba was an activist. He formed the MNC, the Mouvement National Congolais. Lumumba's exact political philosophy, definitely early on at least, was more nationalist oriented. It was more of a purely independent struggle, not necessarily to attribute any illusions on Lumumba's part, especially when he you know, is very clear about 
fighting colonialism and independence meaning and economic liberation. But one thing that Emmanuel makes a lot of interesting points about is that Lumumba was backed initially by high finance by the Belgian Liberal Party, which I think saw all of these secession plots taking place by the, you know, the white settlers and their allies on the Belgian Socialist Party, saw that to keep control of resources and of labor in the Congo, they would support a flag independence rather than this sort of secession attempt, which would lead to something like a Rhodesia or a South Africa. And in the worst case, as his analysis shows, the worst case scenario is a new United States in terms of complete independence and creation of a kind of white ethno state. The high finance was worried because in these situations, uh, these white ethno states were very economically protectionist and made it a lot harder for uh, existing you know, foreign capitalists to enter and use the resources at will. It placed more different stringent priorities in this kind of national socialist kind of kind of manner of serving the, the, the dominant white ethnicity. So it, it wouldn't have been good for these big business groups, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we can talk about the role of mm-hmm. apartheid South Africa in the in the world system, about its relation to the broader centers of global power and the capitalist power in the US, but also whether there were some sort of tensions between them in terms of control over resources and so on. You know, when Emmanuel's talking about this, especially as he's writing in the 70s, for these later articles, something in the background of all of them is apartheid South Africa. The secession attempts in Katanga fail. There's not enough of a settlement in the Congo to perpetuate a similar kind of situation. But I think the implication is, you know, whenever he's writing, for example, he'll make these little points. This is the same case as we can say for the other white settler ethnic states that have established themselves in Africa. And I think clearly Rhodesia and mainly South Africa are the two people can misread this argument as he's saying that high finance or the metropole mm. cares about the the colonized populations they really want to support independence against kind of apartheid structure his analysis is more of a pure cut what is the economic interest at play and the metropoles are very clearly losing if america style or apartheid style mm. has its own domestic capitalism even in the case of south africa has you know develops its own industry over time begins to act in its own imperialistic way, that it's always in the interest of the imperialist countries to make sure they are the sole profiteer of labor and resources in South Africa, have developed a very high standard of living for its white population through its own domestic exploitation, when all of those resources could go flowing to the global north. And that you know, plays a role with respect to South Africa's own role in destabilizing the Congo Later on, they'll support Mobutu and use the Congo against the MPLA in Angola, all to perpetuate this exploitation of resources and diamond in particular. But before going further down on that side, just to make a brief point about how Emmanuel may have come into contact with Lumumba, Berlin makes this really interesting note that Lumumba was in urban associations called the Sukh. Uh, He was the head of one of these urban associations which also were primarily designed for alumni of some of the colonial Christian schools. This was the way to get an education, the way to gain access to political circles and political connections. And Emmanuel likely through these networks as he was going in the Congo would have come into contact with Lumumba's movement. He was offering economic policy advice in particular as the independence movement was trying to figure out what its orientation would be. Emmanuel is not offering it necessarily how to immediately transition the, the mm. con- socialism. He's not being brought in as a technocrat at the nationalization, but his advice was primarily around what to do with respect to trade policy. Through a lot of his writing, it becomes pretty clear that his, his interest is in balancing these forces and trying to navigate a clear path. So, and as we'll see later on, he's very clear about what the balance of forces would be. And he's making a lot of advice with respect to how to transition towards socialism and how to make a uniquely Congolese form of socialism, which is where I think it's pretty clear that his policy advice for Lumumba was socialistic in character, even if overtly a lot of the movement is not necessarily a communist party. It's more of an independence movement. When did Emmanuel start advising Lumumba? Like 1955, 1956. 
oh, he wow. becomes kind of early on. so it's early on in it's before Lumumba becomes prime minister it's also before he bec- he is imprisoned which is in 1957 and then is released and then becomes the prime minister one of the key debates as Lumumba comes to power is what the future of the Congo as an entity should be. The ethnic tensions that the Belgians stoked are colliding and calls for the Congo to be broken up into multiple ethnic states are intensifying. Lumumba is resolutely against this, as was Emmanuel, and calls for all of the Congo's different ethnic and linguistic groups to join as one nation. Lumumba's MNC is definitely the more progressive section of this Evolue class that was committed to some sort of united congo that could best use its economic potential rather than splitting up into ethnic infighting you know manipulated by foreign power to keep it weaker so we can see lumumba as this real patriot this big critic of belgian colonialism we see a, a contradiction here as the congo is gaining its independence on the one hand control of resources and labor, which both Lumumba's MNC and Belgian finance believe is more possible under a centralized United Congo. And Emmanuel writes, Belgian high finance remained resolutely unionist, but with the belief that they could continue to control a neo-colonial Congo. And on the other hand, a desire to promote secessionism and devolution from a centralized state which is promoted by ethnic Congolese parties opposed to Lumumba, as well as the settlers. Ultimately, Belgian finance went from being on Lumumba's side in support of centralization, but it couldn't reconcile itself with Lumumba, and in the end, it would join with the secessionists to remove him. For Emmanuel, he's trying to figure out the question of how did Belgium's preferred outcome of having this party that's not socialists turn into a situation where they have to destabilize the entire country, perpetuate civil war, perpetuate secession to guarantee their interests. Part of that is Lumumba's unexpected turn towards radically militant anti-colonial positions. There's this one really famous event which took place, the granting of independence to Congo by Belgium. And it was done in this sense of, oh, the, the Belgian state, the king has decided in his infinite wisdom to give you independence and we can continue working together in the future. And Belgium has done so much good for Congo. And the king gave this whole speech. Belgium. And then he, you know, expected that they would all clap. But then Mumba stood up and he gave this speech really attacking Belgian colonialism. It's very radical speech, which resulted in lots of ovation for him. du Congo constitue l'aboutissement de l'œuvre conçue par le génie du roi Léopold II va se connaître à leur fils et à leur petit-fils l'histoire glorieuse de notre lutte pour la liberté. Obviously lots of hatred against Lumumba from these kind of conservative colonial sections of society. And there were plenty of parties, these very conservative parties, that were opposed to Lumumba. These were a mask for reactionary white settler interests. So these white settler interests were infuriated by Lumumba's attacks against colonialism. And they found an ally with one of these reactionary parties that promoted secession. Moïse Chambé, who was a descendant of the Lunda royalty and an ethno-nationalist for the Lunda in Katanga, he led a Lunda party called the Confédération des Associations Tribal du Katanga, or Konoka. And Konoka formed an electoral alliance with the, with the Union Katangese party that represented the white Belgian settlers of Katanga. Shambe was useful to the settlers to offer an African opposition to Lumumba, and Shambe consistently accused Lumumba of being a secret communist ready to take support from the Soviets. You know, the Belgian settlers and Belgium are the ones who take these first steps in reaction to telling the truth about colonialism. He talks about King Leopold and he just says the truth of the history. Their immediate reaction to that is this guy is a Soviet puppet and needs to be 
dealt with. This total 180 from Lumumba could be, you know, acting in the interest of finance to Lumumba is going to be taking weapons and aid from the Soviets only after the Katanga secession, only after the white settlers begin violence in the country. Lumumba moves towards the West is not going to help me here. The United Nations is not going to help. So I have to take aid from the Soviets, uh, which represents more than anything a strategic recognition that the Soviets are the only force that could bring aid in his situation. Once again, the United Nations Security Council sits in emergency session on the mounting crisis in the Congo. Representatives of Congo Premier Patrice Lumumba are insisting that the UN take over Katanga province by force. And the Soviet Union delivers an ultimatum for Belgian troops to get out, or else. But as the Katanga secession emerges, Emmanuel makes a lot of really interesting points of who starts it and then how it goes. He has this note in his 1972 article where he says, Belgian capitalism was faced with the fate accompli of a break with Lumumba, following the mutiny of the local army and the other troubles stirred up by the settlers that obliged Lumumba and Kasavubu to appeal for help to the Soviet Union. It's only after the Belgian settlers begin backing Shambe, Moe Shambe and Katanga, begin pushing for the secession and the white, not necessarily a, an ethno state as such because it is led by Shambe, but clearly backed by settler interests. Lumumba has on his side a lot of tension with the Congolese mm. independent army, which wants to get rid of white officers in charge. That's exactly of- what I was about to talk about, actually. So that's really- yeah, go for yeah. it. It's clear that quite shortly after he'd taken power, the West was fairly antagonistic towards him because you already had UN, US support to the uh, secession, which was obviously being really wholeheartedly supported by the Western powers. And this was right after he takes support. And then also the West is supporting these different fifth column trader elements in Lumumba's government, like Chambe, and then also obviously Mobutu and so on. But the thing about the problems in the army is really interesting. I actually just brought up that People's History of Congo book because it has a really interesting section talking about this, the, the uprising by the soldiers in the army that were demanding the Africanization of the army, removal of white officers. And as I understand, they were also demanding reduction in privileges for the upper officers as well in terms of pay. And, and Lumumba Fuse said, no, there has to be more training. We need to be trained more to get these higher privileges. But then, and this is a point that's made by the author uh, Zongolo, Galaja people responded like, well, what training have you guys like have the ever aware that have taken control of the of the country following independence? Like you guys also don't really have that much education and but you're getting these huge privileges and there's uprisings against the new independent government. The the book also talks about how having quite independence, Shamba and different new leaders of the Congo went to Belgium in April, May 1960, this economic roundtable conference. Mm-hmm. This is where basically the economic fate of, of Congo was decided which involved basically giving a huge amount of economic power to the Belgians, all of it, that even though political independence had been obtained, economic independence wasn't. The Union Minier, the the biggest mining company in in, uh, in Congo, the Belgian mining company, 75% of all the country was cobalt. And also in terms of the world, like a huge proportion of the world, cobalt and copper and all all these different minerals came from, from this mine company and after independence it was agreed that it was still basically going to remain in Belgian hands. As Shambé secured the interests of Union Minière in Katanga, they switched from supporting Lumumba's vision of a united Congo to backing secession to remove a Soviet backstate state under Lumumba. And the Belgian army actually began training the Katangese army under Shambé this secessionist settler army with mercenaries. I think what Emmanuel identifies is the change in the balance of forces is that Shambé had turned from being an enemy on the side of the settlers to being a ally of, like you mentioned, the US of Belgian high finance, exactly because Lumumba had turned to the Soviets. American imperialism, uh, of course, had a role in this all, and it was opposed fundamentally to the Soviet military aid coming to Lumumba. President Eisenhower reportedly said he, quote, wished that Lumumba would fall into a river full of crocodiles. So the CIA backed Joseph Mobutu, who would launch a coup against Lumumba, and then arrest him on December 1st in 1960. 
Then on January 17, 1961, after being imprisoned and tortured, Lumumba was deported to Katanga, where he was met by Shambay and subsequently executed by Belgian and Katangese mercenaries. They caught him on his way to Stanleyville and flew him back. Patrice Lumumba securely wrote. With him were men who served in his cabinet when he was prime minister. They were bundled into a heavily guarded lorry and driven off towards a place called Binza. His recapture was quite a triumph for Colonel Mobutu, who now saw his enemy arrive. Lumumba's bonds are tightened. They were taking no chances. And his wife and child watch his humiliation. The whole affair, of course, serves to underline once again the conditions prevailing in the Congo. It's not enough to arrest a man. He must apparently be beaten up as well then put him on trial later, no doubt. Arrest, ill-treatment, imprisonment, death. Such was the fate of Patrice Lumumba. In Paris, the Federation of African Students demonstrated near the Belgian Embassy. They said it was to show their concern over events in Africa and to express their mourning at the death of Lumumba. Finally, reaction in Cairo. Carrying Lumumba's picture, a large crowd marched to the Belgian Embassy. Demonstrators climbed the railings and began their anti-Belgian protest by kicking down the embassy shield. American and Belgian imperialism allied with Shambé and the settlers in Katanga to commit this heinous crime. But the imperialists were playing the long game and were still fundamentally opposed to the settlers in Katanga. So after using Shambé to kill Lumumba, Emmanuel writes that the imperialists turned on him quote, the Western reflex may have taken precedence over other considerations. If this is true, their attitude only represented a brief moment of opportunism. Soon, with the neutralization and the physical elimination of Lumumba, Shambay and his secessionist state once more became the main target for the imperialist offensive to crush the Katanga secession and the settlers' aspirations. In the end, Instead of Lumumba's pan-Africanist United Congo, the imperialists would rather promote Zaire, a neo-colonial centralized regime under Mobutu, open for extraction. I want to turn actually to this really interesting footnote that Emmanuel has in his 1972 article on, on Lumumba and Shambay, which I think reveals a little bit of his thoughts around the time. This is, of course, him writing later on. He says, let me not be misunderstood. The fact that Shambay was attacked by financial imperialism does not therefore mean that he played a historically progressive role. On the contrary, it means that in an unprecedented historical conjuncture, this role was played by international high finance. Shambay personified the threat of complete enslavement and probable physical extermination which then hung over the Congolese people and which still hangs over Africa as a whole, which I think is another reference to like apartheid South Africa. This threat comes from the white settlers. In comparison, the international high finance, which fought Shambay represented and still does represent the lesser evil for that part of Africa. This explanation is necessary because at a previous presentation of my thesis in Paris, one of the participants in the discussion reproached me with presenting Shambay as the good man and Lumumba as the traitor. I do not know which part of my text could have caused such a misunderstanding, which has me saying the exact opposite of what I think. Shambay was quite simply the total traitor. But there was no treason in a policy of alliance with high finance in order to resist the mounting pressure of the settlers. In the given circumstances, this was the vital interest, the only possible salvation of the Congolese people. I think this is a really interesting note with respect to the balance of forces that is occurring within this time period. And Emmanuel's position, you know, Emmanuel is watching as this is occurring and, and sees Lumumba get removed from power. Now, just on his own biographical note, Emmanuel had been kidnapped and deported from the Congo by settlers. He was deported to Nairobi in Kenya. And this is likely because as all of these tensions begin to explode, he's identified as being traitor uh, on the side of Lumumba. He's like a traitor to the capitalists, the white settlers, because he's been aiding Lumumba. Even though he's deported, he continues advising the Lumumbist movement based around Antoine Gizenga, who is Lumumba's Deputy Prime Minister. In 1960, as Lumumba is being imprisoned, as the Congo is, is falling into a state of crisis, Gizenga leaves Leopoldville and moves to 
Stanleyville, which is in modern day Kisangani. And he forms a rival government to the government of Kasavubu and Mobutu, who had arrested Lumumba and imprisoned him and would later lead to his execution. He leads this government, which is officially known as the Free Republic of the Congo from 1960 to 1962. Lumumba always had to play this very delicate game of balancing all of these actors between Shambe, between Mobutu, because he, he was promoting a united Congo and not a, an openly socialist one. But Gizenga more openly says, we're going to be a, a socialist republic in the Congo, continuing like Lumumba's legacy, Lumumba's thought. And this government is recognized during this time period by the entire Eastern Bloc, Cuba, Iraq, the United Arab Republic, Ghana, Guinea, the Algerian provisional government at the time, and Morocco. And Emmanuel becomes an advisor as he had continued supporting Lumumba. He continues on with the Lumumbist faction in the Congo crisis. And he just gives, like in this letter that he writes in 1961, some really interesting advice to Gizenga on the policies to take in this period of crisis. So he says, maintain postal relations with the rest of the world without going through Leopoldville. So he's he's advising the government not to let their communications fall into the hands of Mobutu and, and Kasavubu. And he instead recommends that they go through a postal union in Switzerland. He says one thing that's really important is to establish an airline directly from Stanleyville to Cairo. So he's, I think, clearly advising that they maintain these relations with with Nasser's Egypt, with the broader third world and second world that is like supporting the Free Republic of the Congo. He advises them to develop their own infrastructure, look at the prospects of maintaining their own domestic production of gold and gain some revenue for this independent government. And I think really because Emmanuel believes this is going to be a possible socialist government to rival the other one, so he sees it as legitimate, make a transition towards socialism for this breakaway government. He advised them really interestingly to study the prospects of obtaining foreign aid from the second world, so make a a very clear move in the Cold War. He talks about the need for external finance from either private capital or the aid from friendly states, socialist bloc. He advises them to have absolutely no consideration of the colonists, except some functions that would be needed, like as technicians, engineers, uh, economists, teachers. Other than that, have no consideration of them as officers, absolutely not in the military. And his last note, he has a really interesting line where he says, be imaginative in seeking formulas for coexistence with the existing trust in a highly planned economy moving towards socialism. It's just really interesting how... Emmanuel saw it at giving his advice to transition this breakaway government towards a socialist state in the Congo. That really ties in with his later work from the 1980s about the world countries really should go to get advanced technology to develop their economies uh, with like you know appropriate government regulation of transnational corporations, but that they shouldn't shouldn't fall into this left wing Marxist sort of tendency to sort of often see them as this ultimate source of all problems and he also in his later book when you're talking about the this advice to the uh, government how he advises finding ways to to use these uh, large corporations uh in the planned economy um and in, in his later book he also notes how the different socialist states the ussr and uh, china vietnam there's all these different examples of social states that throughout their existence had a lot of fruitful essentially economic cooperation with these uh large western transnational corporations uh ussr even in the 1930s many cases of pop you know forward and pop us different companies going to the ussr and giving them various technological assistance and ussr also you know using this as this blueprint for a highly advanced socialist economy that's another part of emmanuel's strategic analysis which is you know it's quite realistic about the way the world is going to look in the sort of medium maybe maybe long term future a very realistic look at the way in which that world countries poor countries should navigate this world and create a more economically advanced and socially just society but yeah in realistic practical practical sense that that is in in line with the experience of different socialist countries uh, and their history that we've had in the 20th century. I was talking at the start about how in, say, like Western Marxism, there's 
often there's this attempt to villainize that people like Emmanuel, as they don't know real Marxism and their heads are stuck in these theories and they don't want to ally with the working class, um, as, as if the, the first world working class is the whole world's working class. But in reality, you can see Emmanuel, he's very, very politically active and really has in mind the lessons of the development of the existing social states. And you can really see how Emmanuel is a really great counterpoint alternative to Western Marxism, which sort of says, oh, you know, like all the socialist states, they were all just awful and evil and so yeah. on. Mm-hmm. And Emmanuel is quite positive about them, obviously, and very often writes about the great experience of the USSR and the socialist China and, and their relevance to third world economic development more generally. And you can see this in his cooperation with Kuzenko as well in his recommendations. So, Yeah, absolutely. In our later episodes on the subject of the Congo, we'll talk more about how the the history continues from here. Of course, the Gazenga government fell uh, as a result of the, the crisis in the Congo. So did Shambay. And of course, I think all of this leads the, the stage to Mobutu, who is absolutely the man of Belgian imperialism, of American imperialism, prototypical comprador, will come to power out of all of this. As we continue, we won't necessarily cover any more of Emmanuel's biography, but we wanted to use this as an introduction to say how it is having this direct participation in the struggle and observation of the conditions in the Congo on the ground help unequal exchange as a framework to understand what is contemporarily happening in the Congo in the past few decades with the, the never-ending plundering of the Congo by the West um, through all, all mechanisms, direct, uh, of course, through trade as well. So this framework and this theory really helps us understand what's happening in the Congo as we'll trace the political and economic history. And it's good, I think, for us to establish that part of this theory was formed and really being an ally to the continuing liberation struggle of the Congolese people. So thanks so much for joining and uh, take care, Peter. Have a good one. Thanks a lot, Joseph. See you.